Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. You know, for all of my many quibbles about the John Gardner continuation Bond novels, something that I definitely can't ding them on is stakes. And my god, this book ends with James Bond at the White House saving the lives of the British Prime Minister and the President of the United States. I've said before that I like these books when they go a bit outrageous, and this is definitely one of those. This is definitely an all aboard the Baron Sabody Express to Crazy Town John Gardner book. <laughs> Scorpius, released in 1988 in the UK and sees Bond go up against the leader of a like an extremist religious cult, which is something quite unique in my experience of the series as a whole so far. I think the closest that we've seen to this in any other kind of Bond media is Live and Let Die or License to Kill. But this really takes it to another level. It's kind of like Alistair Crowley or Charles Manson as a Bond villain. I think that the book opens really effectively. It's this young woman and she's running through the streets of London. She's terrified. She's running away from these people who are trying to catch her and it's really like intense and atmospheric and then it ends with her dying in the Thames. When her body is recovered she's found to have a telephone number on her for none other than James Bond's apartment. So while MI6 might not normally be terribly interested in random bodies that wash up in the Thames. This is obviously a reason for this case to get in front of M, who of course calls in James Bond. It's M and her chief superintendent Bailey from Special Branch, who brief Bond on the situation and specifically that the young woman was named Emma Dupree and that she was a follower of the Meek Ones. This is a cult run by a father Valentine, but of course this is a John Gardner book, so obviously every character needs to have multiple names. So Father Valentine is an alias for Vladimir Scorpius, uh, and as well as running a society of religious fanatics, he also deals arms, and stay with me on this one, runs a credit card company. The first two thirds of this book, more or less, are entirely set in the UK, and it sees Bond and the Secret Service investigating what Scorpius could be up to, and things start to escalate real quickly when it turns out that Scorpius is brainwashing his followers into becoming suicide bombers, and he's targeting British politicians around the country in the lead up to a general election. I thought it was one of the more interesting time capsule elements of this book that Gardner feels that he needs to spend a couple of pages kind of explaining to the reader what a suicide bomber is and what the mentality they may be having to, to make them carry out these things. It's just one of those like, god if that book was released today it would not need those pages. We're all very sadly aware of the nature of suicide bombing in this day and age. It kind of surprised me how successful Scorpius was with his various assassinations here. I mean there's one bit in particular that is dedicated to this like seemingly beloved by all retired prime minister Lord Mills. He is killed, and M is really shaken up by it, and there's like a good passage or two of like how beloved this politician was, and everyone liked him, no matter what side of the political spectrum you were on, everyone loved this guy. And I thought it was interesting reading that, like the, the fact that this is about the lead up to a general election, and politicians are being named and involved and, and all that, it just kind of... It, it felt odd to me, because like, John Gardner is clearly making up these characters. He's making up a history here. Lord Mills was not a British Prime Minister in the 20th century, so I thought that it was interesting that he was making that decision to remove Bond from our real-world history. Up until now, I've just always assumed that Bond exists in, in the, the time in which the book was released, and the history of the books is the same as our real-world history. I mean, particularly going back to the Flemings, where he would name real-life politicians and organizations and such. And here, like like Gardner says, this Lord Mills was a two-term prime minister or, or, or whatever. And it was just like, oh, wow, okay, you're really detaching this. And it's clear why he does that, because he wants to have these political assassinations be a part of the story, and you obviously can't do that naming real... <laughs> you know, real-world politicians are at that time. It's not Bond going to save Margaret Thatcher, but it, it, it's a really 
big decision, I think, to kind of rewrite the history of the books, uh, the, 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 the timeline. So I, it did jar with me just a little bit. Anyway, all the while this is going on, Bond is doing a lot of back and forth across London. There's this Lord Shrivenham, whose daughter is in a state of delirium after she was a part of the Meek Ones, and now she's been brought out and she's recovering at the family home, and Bond has to question her, and I just love those chapters. I've said it before that I think Gardner really works for me. I think he's really on point when he's describing like just something really horrific or violent or gnarly and when this Shrivenham daughter is talking, she's just babbling away like a religious fanatic and Bond is trying to piece together the useful bits of information based on what she's saying, but really kind of creepy. I thought it was really effective. Despite being relatively physically absent for most of the story as well, I thought that Scorpius was actually quite an effective villain, particularly with how Bond and the other Secret Service individuals, they're trying to sort of piece together who this guy is and they're looking at video footage of him and, and doing their research, but I thought it was like paid quite an enigmatic figure. I thought he was an interesting cipher of a villain, the religious cult leader aspect of him anyway. The, <laughs> the credit card company running side. <laughs> Anyway, speaking of credit cards, while investigating that side of the villain's ventures, Bond meets an undercover IRS agent named Harriet Horner. She's the main Bond girl of this thing, and she does become crucial to the climax of the story, which takes place at Scorpius's base of operations in South Carolina. Both Horner and Bond are taken captive on Scorpius's island, and through a very convoluted reasoning, Scorpius decides that he's going to marry the two. There's this whole thing about how Scorpius wants all of his followers and the people who live on the island to be married and then they have kids and then that's when they go and become suicide bombers when they've reproduced so that he's never going to lose followers through this uh, through this suicide bomber scheme. Anyway, this did prompt what I thought was a really nice callback to uh, Bond's wife Tracy, of course, from On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Uh, this is the passage. For a second, Bond could not stop the rise of emotion as his mind went back to the last time he stood waiting for a bride, his beloved Tracy, the wife who had so tragically been murdered while they travelled to their honeymoon. At this point, her memory, like a wraith, seemed to cloud over Harriet so that she dissolved, her place taken by his dead wife. For a few seconds, Tracy was there again, coming towards him, her face serene. Then the reality snapped back and he took a deep breath, clearing his head and remembering a cynical line he had once read. The past is a bucket of ashes. I thought that was a really nice callback, actually, and it felt very relevant to this particular story as well, given that Bond is, um, it's a sham marriage, but it's a, you know, a marriage nonetheless. And on a slightly different note, there's also, there's also a, a reference to Sean Connery in this. Bond is, uh, being taken to Scorpius's island, so he's on the plane. Uh, and, uh, yeah, what's this? Uh, settled back to watch the in-flight movie. Though he had already seen it, Bond sat through it again. The Untouchables. A favourite actor of his played a Chicago cop. I think it's, I think that's a little bit on the nose and a bit kind of crass. But hey, I mean, if Ian Fleming can reference Ursula Andress in one of his books, then I guess John Gardner can reference Sean Connery. So Bond and Harriet Horner are married, and it's not really valid, or Bond at least muses that it's not really valid. He kind of goes along with it because he figures that it's going to buy him some time to figure out how to thwart the villain's scheme. I liked how Gardner never really portrays Horner as being much of a serious romantic interest for Bond. Like, but you even hear Bond's internal thinking at one point, and he's like, yeah, she's nice and everything, but she's definitely not marriage material. I wouldn't marry this lady, which is... Um, you know, convenient, considering she's going to be dead before the book ends. So this is the climax of the thing. Bond and Horner are trapped at Scorpius's island, and Scorpius is like, well, look, there's no way that you can escape because, you know, we're out in the middle of nowhere, and even if you get to the ocean, you know, there's all of these marshes and swampland-type things that you need to get through, which are full of these poisonous snakes and scorpions and other things that are going to kill you. So he's kind of, he kind of doesn't worry too much. It's like, well, you're not really going to be able to escape anyway. And I kind of like the notion of the base being so surrounded by all these poisonous creatures and it's like, you know, calling back to 
Blofeld's Garden of Death from Fleming's Young Live Twice, I think it's really nice. Bond wonders if he should wait it out a little longer, but instead he decides, no, you know what, we're gonna just have to take our chances here. He needs to get off the island and report to, um, you know, his higher-ups. So he takes Harriet Horner with him, and they're running through these swamps, uh, you know, getting attacked by all these creatures, and they get to the sea, and she's, like, been screaming and goes unconscious. And then he's swimming, like, away for about five minutes. And then a boat appears, and you think it's Scorpius's bed, but no, it's actually the CIA. And they drag Bond and Harriet into this little dinghy, and it, Horner's dead because she's been bitten by these poisonous snakes with this really fast-acting venom, apparently. Um, and then there's a moment where the CIA guy's like, Oh, heck, James, if you'd have just waited an extra ten minutes, we were, we, were, we literally just raided the place, we've secured it, you know, if, if you hadn't, you didn't need to go through all this, you could have just waited ten minutes and <laughs> we'd have been there to save you. And it's just really bizarre because it means that Bond has, like, him and Horner were under no immediate danger. They didn't have to try and make their getaway at that exact moment if he had her just stuck around she'd be alive. And I think that this is an interesting concept. Like, I kind of like the idea that Bond has made a mistake that has such grave, deadly consequences. I, I wish that Gardner's point in this plot detail <laughs> was a little bit clearer, because I'm not quite sure what he's getting at. It just makes Bond seem like a bit of a not very good at his job. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like Gardner might be like going for some kind of faith theme here with all of the other like religious cult stuff going on. I don't know if like Bond should have had faith and just held out a bit longer and then this person would have been alive. I don't know. It's just it, it's not very clear, I didn't think. But all it really seems to do is give him the motivation to go back into the thing and find Scorpius because you know, the CIA have you know, taken over the island now, but Scorpius had a little hiding place and Bond finds it and he takes him out the back to the marshes and he points a gun at him and he says, right, you're gonna die the same way she did, so off you go into the marshes. And Scorpius is like, no, no, and Bond's like, no, off you go. And sure enough, Scorpius walks in and the snakes start biting at him and he falls over dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cold, actually. Like, I really like it. Bond is sending this man to a really awful death. Uh, but it's really... It, it, it's it's really gnarly. And then the other characters arrive and they see Scorpius dead over in the thing. Like, oh, for God's sake, James, we wanted him alive. And Bond's like, oh, it's not my fault. Bloody lunatic went running off into his own swamp. Can you believe it? But by this point, it has become clear that Scorpius' followers are so brainwashed that they'll be carrying out his plans even though he's dead. And so we're in the last chapter of the book now, and it's such a whirlwind. I mean, this is John Gardner, so obviously there is a double cross in here, because of course there is. And it's really weird because there's a lot of Bond in this last, like, in this last chapter, just pointing at supporting characters and being all like, it's not you, is it? And they're like, no, no, it's not me. And he's satisfied by that, but sure enough, the real perpetrator is eventually revealed, and then in a whirlwind of the last five pages, Bond heads to the White House to rescue the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from being assassinated. You know, I genuinely couldn't believe what I was reading in the in this last chapter. About two-thirds of this chapter are just waffle. It's Bond and the other characters stood around talking. And then Bond is suddenly in DC, and it's really weird. I don't know if Gardner just got to an acceptable word limit for the book and just gave up, because you'd think that Bond saving the lives of two world leaders like this <laughs> would would be... Uh, you know, maybe you would spend a couple of chapters on that rather than just five pages, but it's over really quickly and the whole book ends on a relatively moody note. It is really just, just over one page of Bond in M's office and he's still upset about Harriet Horner's death and M's weirdly tries to set him up with the Shrivenham girl, who has apparently recovered from her incoherent ramblings earlier on, and Bond's sort of like, um, nah, I'm not that fussed, but, you know, maybe, maybe once the funerals are out of the way, I'll take her to dinner. So, despite that last third going a bit off the rails, I did actually have a really good time with this one. I thought that some of the creepier, more violent imagery worked really well, and I liked Bond zipping around London, and, you know, interrogating characters, and I was really engaged and quite riveted by it. There were even a couple of moments that sent shudders down my spine, which, um, you know, I, I thought, you know, fair play, Gardner, I thought there was some effective creepy horror writing going on in this one. It really falls apart at the end when you have Bond making such an insanely stupid move that Q 
kills the main Bond girl. And then there's this really rushed coda at the White House, which feels way too high profile a thing for Bond to be directly involved in. It's a bit crass, a bit fan fiction-y. <laughs> Bond directly saving the life of the Prime Minister. It's... Ugh. I do wonder if Bond being responsible for Horner's death is an element that might come back in a future John Gardner novel, because I assume that you would have a lot of trauma associated with such a thing. It's just such a big, weird, heavy concept to be dealing with, and in fact, Gardner barely deals with it at all in this particular book, so um, I really hope it wasn't just Gardner just being tidy because Bond gets married to her, and even though it is technically an invalid marriage, did he think there would still be a question mark hang hanging over it if she'd have ended the story alive? I, 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 I don't know. Or, or maybe it is just <laughs> a running theme. Every woman Bond is, even Sham married to, will end up dead by the end of the story. When it comes to ranking this one, I'm actually going to give it a podium spot, believe it or not. It is my third favourite of the John Gardner stories so far. While I certainly had some seriously significant issues with the ending, I did feel that for the most part this one worked really well, and it engaged me, what can I say? I like that Bond is up against something very different here, in a religious cult leader with a suicide bomber following. It's it's such a, a different kind of villainy for Bond to be going up against, and I it felt kind of original to me in that regard. And as I say, I really enjoyed Gardner leaning into the creepy stuff, which I think he does really well. Um, I had a lot of fun with this one. Or am I myself delirious from snake venom? Please do let me know your thoughts on this one, as always, in the comment section below. And also below, you can click subscribe and the Mrs. Bell notification button to stay up to date on future video uploads that I make on this channel. There's other links below as well. And until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.